All right, uh, I think we're going to get started. All right, so welcome to Phil 3. Um, uh, all right, so today we're going to talk about uh, neuroscientific approaches to answering this consciousness question. Um, so in last lecture, uh, we talked about Thomas Nagel's What It's Like to Be a Bat uh, paper. Um, and just a very quick review, I mean, the, the general point he's trying to get across there is that um, there's a separate question that we have. Um, we can know all of the facts about bats' brains, um, how they process information, uh, all the facts about the bats' environment. Um, we can know all these kind of physical facts. We can know all these uh, uh, you know, fact of the matter facts. Uh, but there's this leftover fact, this fact about what it is like to be the bat. Um, and Nagel thinks this is, this is really important because without knowing this extra fact, we can't really know what it's what the conscious experience of the bat is like. Um, and uh, if you buy Nagel's argument, this is going to have uh, repercussions for what kind of theory of consciousness you can provide. Uh, because um, you know, if you think that we can know all the scientific facts about bat brains and nevertheless have this leftover question, um, it's going to say that uh, scientific theories about what consciousness is, uh, they're not going to do it. Um, they're not going to answer our questions. So. Uh, so today's goal really is going to be to put on the table uh, a scientific theory about what consciousness is. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be advocating for it. Really, the, the idea is going to be uh, we're going to look at the top-notch neuroscience of today, uh, see what it has to say about uh, what, uh, what kind of brain state you have to be in to be conscious, what kind of functional state you have to be in to be conscious, uh, and see if that's answering the kinds of questions we've been uh, running into. Um, Cool. So that, that's the goal for today. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll first start off talking about the, the function of consciousness. So, um, you know, it's, we oftentimes think about consciousness in terms of these, um, these qualitative feelings that associate um, uh, mental processes. We think of them as these special feelings or sensations. Um, but you can also take a, a different tack uh, in approaching consciousness. You can say that, um, you know, through consciousness and only through consciousness are we able to do many of the things that we do. Um, you know, consciousness bestows upon us an ability to uh, have executive control over our actions, uh, to, uh, to engage in certain deliberative thought processes. Um, you know, we can think about this in terms of an example of, um, you know, we can compare whether or not something is conscious in our, in our minds is going to reflect, or gonna, going to reflect what we're able to do about it. So maybe one example might be, um, if I'm unconsciously tapping my foot at, at the cafe uh, and the person next to me tells me to stop tapping my foot, um, the tapping my foot might have been unconscious the whole time. I might have been tapping it. I might have been, uh, I might have been working on this lecture, and the person next to me says, hey, stop that annoying tapping. Um, and you know, them saying that brings the tapping of my foot to my attention. Um, the tapping of my foot ceases to be unconscious and now becomes conscious. Uh, and now I can go on and control it. I can. I keep tapping my foot while looking at the person and saying, screw you. I can do what I want. I can, uh, I can stop, stop the tapping and apologize. Um, it allows them bring my tapping to the to, to level of consciousness, uh, opens up a possibility of actions that weren't there before. Um, you might have thought that until the tapping became conscious, uh, I wasn't able to um, make any kind of top-down uh, I, I was, didn't have any top-down control over my tapping. My foot was just tapping. I wasn't tapping. My foot was tapping. Um, or at least that's a natural way of speaking. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, if, you, if you want to put pressure on this, feel free to. Um, but uh, that's maybe one natural example to kind of help, uh, help give you this intuition that there is a function of consciousness, not just this uh, extra special qualitative feel to it. Um, and we can capture that further and say that you know, conscious attention allows for top-down control. It allows for planning and initiating intentional action. And this is the tack that Dehane and Akash take uh, in the opening of their paper. Um, uh, and so let's take a look at, they, they point to some empirical findings uh, that say that uh, consciousness allows for uh, the durable and, explicit, uh, durable and explicit information maintenance. We can keep things in mind because we're conscious of them and only because we're conscious of them. They say that uh, consciousness allows for us to, um, to 
make novel combinations of operations. We can uh, combine abilities that maybe were closed off in their own sectors of the, of the mind before and combine them together uh, on a single task. Um, and consciousness also allows us to engage in intentional behavior. So you might think that until we have a conscious mind in on it, um, really these are just kind of uh, hardwired mechanisms going about their business, and we aren't really in on it. Um, so I'm just going to walk through these points that they uh, raise in the beginning of their paper. So, um, so Dehane and Nakash uh, first go through this idea that uh, you know, consciousness al allows durable and explicit information maintenance. Um, so they write that we suggest that in many cases, the ability to maintain representations in an active state for a durable period of time in the absence of stimulation seems to require consciousness. Um, so the example they use is there's a, there's a classical experiment by Sperling um, on iconic memory that demonstrates uh, in the absence of conscious amplification, uh, the visual representation of an array of letters quickly decays to undetectable levels. Um, so after a few seconds or less, only the letters that have been consciously attended remain accessible. So just to, I guess, translate that, uh, the idea here is just that you know, if you're flashed a bunch of letters in front of you on the screen, um, and someone asks you a second later, you know, what was the top right letter, you might have access to that. But, um, but if someone says, pay it, I'm going to flash some letters on the screen to you. Um, pay attention to what letters in the top right. Uh, and you're going to have to report that back to me in a minute. Um, you'll be able to do, uh, you'll be able to report that letter in the, uh, in the second case, but not in the first case a minute later. Um, so by consciously attending to representations, it allows us to call them back up while they're being attended to, while they're being kept in uh, like local memory storage or some, uh, they're, they're basically just pointing to an experimental result that needs to be accounted for. Um, here's something that when we tell someone to consciously attend to something, it allows them to do something that they weren't able to do before. Um, so again, the, the idea is just that consciousness gives us an ability that we didn't have um, before uh, there was conscious attention there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so basically, the, the, the idea is that when you consciously attend to a stimuli, you can hold it in focus. You can keep it before your mind's eye. It's present to you in a way that it wouldn't be if you weren't attending to it. Um, so that's, uh, that's finding number one. Uh, finding number two is that. Um, well, as Decane and Nakash write, the strategic operations with their, which are associated with planning a novel strategy, evaluating it, uh, controlling its ex execution, and correcting possible errors cannot be accomplished unconsciously. Um, they continue, they say that such processes are always associated with a subjective feeling of mental effort, um, which is absent during automatized or unconscious processing. Um, so you know, the, the point here is just that. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can do this test yourself. Um, you know, try to come up with a plan for how you're going to trick your friend uh, into taking you to dinner. Um, uh, you can't come up with a plan like that unless you engage in conscious, reflective, deliberative thought. Um, it's not like you're going to find yourself tricking them into a scheme uh, without uh, kind of conscious, reflective deliberation. Um, there's, there are certain kinds of novel operations that are really only conscious once we engage in a certain kind of reflective thought. Um, and um, I mean, so yeah, the, the point is that in order to do something more than just hardwired automatic responses, uh, it requires conscious deliberative thought. Um, so uh, you know, when you're presented with a decision, you, you, you can just you know, go with your gut. Um, you know, uh, but in this case, we're, uh, you're just letting your automatic settings take over. Um, so the kinds of cases we're interested in here are um, where you can think through a problem and come up with your own solution. Uh, and it's not predetermined by uh, some hardwired system. Um, so again, this is a, a functional characteristic uh, of consciousness, or according to Dehane and Akash. Um, uh, thir the third finding they, they point to in the scientific literature is that, um, well, they write that a third type of mental activity that may be specifically associated with consciousness uh, is the spontaneous generation of intentional behavior. Um, so just the idea here being that you know, we can engage in all sorts of unconscious behaviors. When I, in the example, when I was tapping my foot uh, in the cafe, uh, this was an un unintentional action. I just found myself doing it. I, I didn't have the intention to, to act on it and then uh, put the intention into action. Uh, uh, and this is supposed to be a difference between actions that uh, flow from conscious 
uh, control and those that are flowing from some kind of subconscious control. Uh, yeah, question. So do you think that it's just actions that have this, we have this ability to have sort of subconscious actions, or do you think we can also have like thoughts or, uh, and or like speech that is like along a similar line? Right, yeah, I mean, we'll, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what exactly this distinction between unconscious processes and conscious processes it is. But, um, but to answer your question, I think that um, those who subscribe to this kind of framework, oh, I think this is just an empirical question, really. I mean, uh, and they would say, yes, you can, you can have, uh, you can blurt out, uh, a thought can come to your mind that you didn't, like, call up from memory. So you can think of two different cases where you can say, um, you can ask yourself, you know, who was the 42nd president? Uh, I believe that's Bill Clinton, is that right? Uh, anyway, you can call that, I can, I can ask myself, basically, uh, to tell myself who the 42nd president was. Um, but you might think that whenever I'm working away at the cafe, tapping my foot, and uh, you know, I, I, this image of my mother screaming at me when I was younger, uh, that is a constant thing, that conscious source of anxiety for me, just pops into my head. I didn't ask for this thought to come to my head, it just kind of popped in there. Um, and I think, the, uh, I think the same kind of analysis will, will, will fo uh, follow from that. that um, uh, there's a difference between the kinds of thoughts that are, uh, that are called forth by intentional control of thought processes versus the kinds of thoughts that are brought forth through, um, say, just uh, well, unconscious processes. But we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, uh, I guess any other questions related to that point? Cool. I'll move on. And uh, I'll, I'll stop to take questions about these uh, three things when I'm done. But, um, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, we're talking about intentional behaviors then. So um, the, ex well, the example that Dehane and Akash use is um, a blind sight patients. So blind sight patients, uh, I think we brought them up in class last time, but um, it's a little obscure. Uh, they're subjects who are partially blind. So part of their visual field is just kind of not there. You can, um, they're partially blind, but they can still identify above chance objects in their uh, blind spot. Um, so uh, the, the blind sight person, when you probe them to tell, tell you, or to probe them to guess if there's something in their, in their blind spot, uh, more than chance they, they, can say, they guess, that, guess correctly. To them, they subjectively experience it as just a guess. They say, I have no idea. I'm just guessing here. Um, but for some reason, they're able to do this better than someone who, say, you put a wall in front of that portion of their, um, their visual field. So um, uh, Dehane and Nakash write that these blind sight patients never spontaneously initiate any visually guided behavior in their impaired field. Uh, good performance can be elicited only by forcing them to respond to stimulation. So um, here they're pointing to the fact that in these blind sight patients, they might, have, they might have some kind of access to the information that there's an object in that part of their visual field, um, but that, that kind of knowledge is not available for intentional action. If you put uh, Say if you put a ketchup bottle in their intentional field while they're eating, or in their blind spot while they're eating fries, they're not going to grab for the ketchup and put it on their fries, because that kind of thing is just not available to them. Um, they don't see anything in that spot. Uh, if they're if they're forced to say, you know, is there something in your blind spot, the, they can do a good job with that. But they'll never produce intentional action that's, uh, you know, produced through a kind of top-down conscious reflective uh, process. Um, they can't decide to act on something they see in their blind spot. Yeah. Is yep. functioning the same as like an un a, a regular blind person mm -hmm. where they can't see anything? Or? Yeah, I actually, I'm. Uh, I, function. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so, uh, actually, now that you mention this, I actually think that there might be some research. I'm not a blind sight expert, but. Uh, I think there might be actually some research where uh, they like throw something at them that's in their blind spot, and they do, like automatically yeah. grab it. Um, and I think the but the point here is still the same because you, you might think that this uh, automatic grabbing motion is just totally un an unconscious um, process. So when if you throw your shoe at me and I duck, um, you can think of this as uh, you know I didn't make a decision. I wasn't saying oh wow there's a shoe coming at me I should probably duck. Um, it was just a quick automatic response uh, that didn't really involve any kind of intentional um, action. Uh, but yeah, I, I actually, uh, this is a good question. I, does it, Austin, do you know about this? Whether there's the, sorry, the question was, 
Well, whether or not blind sight patients can respond unconscious do uh, respond unconsciously to things that show up in their uh, their blind spot. Yeah, no, I don't know. About that. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's a good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, right. So the, the blind sight patients are, this is unintentional behavior. Uh, and the point that uh, Dehane and Akash want to make is that blind sight patients can't respond intentionally to things that uh, show up in their blind spot area. Um, so blind sight patients can't act intentionally on things that show up in their blind spot area. Where, but us, who have normal vision, who don't have blind spots, the, which, those things show up in our conscious life, and we can a act on those in, uh, through conscious deliberative processes. Yeah, Kelly. Yeah, so a lot of philosophers have kind of taken this, uh, this tack. They say basically, like, we can kind of imagine uh, blind sight patients who we teach them at every point. They're like, just, tell, you're, just trust your gut. Tell me what, what's there. And like maybe, uh, I, think, I think actually, yeah, Ned Block um, has this example of super blind sighters. I can't remember if Ned Block or Dan Dennett uh, originated it. But the point is that uh, for these kinds of agents, they say that they're conceptually plausible. Um, uh, and that you basically could have them respond to stimuli in exactly the same way we do, but they don't have any kind of conscious life associated with it. Uh, this is a highly contentious, uh, I guess, example. So I won't go along that road. But, uh, but it is an, it's an interesting question to say, uh, what exactly is missing in the, uh, in the blind sight patient that doesn't allow them to act like we normally do? Uh, and so I mean, this is a question that I think Tehan and Akash take themselves to be trying to answer in the paper. So, um, Let's, uh, let's see what the answer is, and then maybe you, know, you, you can push back and see if, that's, uh, if blindsiders can, can actually behave in the same way we do. Um, um, where was I? But uh, Right, OK, so we have blindsiders. Um, and I, from, from these examples, we're supposed to see that there's a real difference between those of us who have real, full-blooded visual experiences and those of us who do not. Um, so we can take, those of us who do have like real, live, conscious visual experiences, we can take in those cues and produce meaningful actions based on them, um, whereas the blind sight patients cannot. So the hypothesis is that we have access to visual information, whereas in blind sight patients, that information is kind of locked away in some inaccessible part of the brain um, that maybe that information can play a role whenever uh, they're forced to make a decision. But it's not available to conscious reflection. Um, and that's supposed to make a big difference. Um, so I guess to wrap up these, these three points all together, the, the, the point is that consciousness solves certain problems. Uh, it allows us to plan effectively. It allows us to integrate information across different modalities, um, the different senses. Uh, it allows for coordination of behavior. Um, and you can, kind of, you can contrast, contrast this with hardwired systems that are uh, inflexible, or unable to plan for novel situations. Um, and what we're really looking for, we're looking for the capacity for top-down control of, um, of behavior, of thought processes, of problem solving. Um, and this calls for a central organizer. Uh, and that's basically what the global workspace theory of consciousness is trying to uh, give a theory of. But, uh, but before I go on and, I guess, fill in what that theory looks like, uh, any questions about the function of consciousness. Does anyone think that these don't actually capture uh, what's going on? In, or does anyone think that these, uh, that consciousness is not necessary for intentional behavior, um, for novel combinations of operations, or durable explicit information maintenance? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a good question of like what, what exactly is required for intentional behavior? Um, I think different people are going to respond differently. I think someone like Dehane and Akash, uh, they're going to want to say that uh, you don't need language in order to, I guess, think through these problems. You maybe think through it in a non-linguistic format. Um, uh, but I guess the idea would be that you, know, you could so maybe an example would be, you know, I have a memory of whenever I, whenever I take the right path, uh, that always gets me eaten by a tiger or something. <laughs> uh, 
uh, as, as an animal. When I take the le right pa left path, that always leads me to food. Um, and you can kind of have a deliberative process where you recall that memory, uh, and that memory is then able to be connected up with your, your uh, decision process in a way that's maybe language free. Uh, but, but this is a, I mean, uh, this is a good question, I guess, as we kind of go on. Uh, you know, the, this kind of idea that consciousness is tied to a, uh, a central organizer, a, a, a top-down planner, um, how much is that a specifically human capability and how much of that is uh, a capability we can ascribe to animals? Um, uh, I, think, I think most of the scientists are going to say that uh, this is something that animals have in degrees. Um, so, um, and I should say non-human animals because we're animals as well. Um, but uh, we don't want to be chauvinistic about this. But uh, uh, yeah, these non-human animals are, are supposed to maybe have this capacity in, uh, in different flavors, um, but they should still be able to, other non-human animals should be also be able to have some kind of deliberative thought process. But this is, this is very contentious. Um, does anyone make the case that animals aren't, don't have this? All right, well, let's, uh, unless there are any other questions, I'll, uh, I'll move on to talk about the, the meat here. Um, so we have, you know, so we have this question about, you know, what, what constitutes, what is, what is the nature of consciousness? Um, and here's, a, here's an answer to that question. Um, uh, and we're going to, I guess, walk through the steps that kind of lead us to the, the, the final answer. Um, but, you know, Dehane and Akash up front think that, they, that they're going to they're gonna answer this question totally and fully. So, they, I mean, they write that uh, within this fresh perspective, firmly grounded in empirical research, the problem of consciousness no longer seems intractable. Um, they really do think that by doing neuroscience, we're going to solve uh, the problems of consciousness. And there just won't be any leftover problems. Um, this is very much, uh, I guess, against what Nagel is trying to do. So I'll be curious once we present this to hear what your thoughts are, with, whether you're convinced by what they're trying to do. So um, the first step of this theory is to uh, note that the mind is massively modular. So uh, the idea is that the mind is comprised of a huge collection of special purpose devices which operate smoothly in their own domain. Um, so a, a module is a relatively independent information processing machine. Uh, and the brain is made up of a hierarchy of these modules, so, uh, organized into subsystems uh, like vision, audition, motor control, uh, so somatosensory perception, emotion, uh, and the list can go on. Um, but the, the general idea is you, you can think of, uh, uh, the picture will help, um, you can think of you know, the mind is this just giant, giant compilation of these little machines that are each, they're each doing their own little jobs. And maybe inside these machines you have smaller machines. And these are each taking in, uh, I'll say this is V1, why not? Um, they're each taking in uh, inputs. Uh, they're communicating, well, they're not communicating with, communicating with one another. They're, they're able to solve problems on their own, maybe send that output somewhere. Um, but the thing is, each one of these has their own task. So this might be, this might be the task of uh, vision. Uh, inside inside the, uh, the parts of the brain that are responsible for vision, there's maybe object recognition. Uh, there's, um, uh, there's like, uh, contrast detectors, there's um, color processing, uh, all sorts of things. And it can, basically, you can go down and down and down until you reach the most basic processes. Yeah, Do they all have to be like mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, a, debatable, a debated question. I think the paradigmatic cases are going to be cases where uh, you have a uh, basically an area of the brain that is dedicated to a particular kind of task. So uh, vision is the one we we know most about, uh, and that's all located in the uh, the back of the brain. Um, so you uh, and and it follows a sort of kind of uh, hierarchy of processing where you have systems that do um, uh, I guess low level uh, um, edge detection. Uh, the, the low-level edge detection goes to like shape detection, and the low-level the shape detection then goes to object recognition. Um, and but I, I I'm I'm not an expert enough on how these actually are instantiated to know whether they're locally um, 
Uh, in general, they're going to be uh, pretty local. Uh, Kira? Um, so I think the neuroscientists are going to be, well, the scientists in general may be sloppy with the terms in a way that we wish they wouldn't be, but I think they are going to be thinking of this in terms of the mind, or sorry, in terms of the brain, uh, and they're going to use the brain and mind interchangeably. So, because um, you might think that, uh, well, look, if the vision, if the vision module were in my mind, I'd be somehow like, I'd be somehow in on the object recognition task. It'd be something like when I'm doing math, I'm in on it. Uh, but you know, whenever I'm like trying to figure out what object is in front of me, that's not this, that's not like some kind of decision process that I'm in on. That's not a part of my mind. Um, I would say that uh, yeah, just gr uh, be a little loose with how you're understanding mind. Uh, this is, I guess, maybe a buzzword that um, a lot of cognitive scientists use to talk about the modular mind. Um, but uh, you can think of it in terms of the brain. That's that's fine. Are there other hands? Um, yeah, okay, so I mean, a few other things to say about this. Um, uh, well, yeah, so you have basically a, little, a collection of machines. And I, I think most people, uh, I guess, working in cognitive science are going to want to say that this is, you know, I've drawn seven here. Uh, they're going to say that there are thou potentially thousands of little machines at work um, that are solving different kinds of problems. Um, and uh, I guess Dehin and Akash uh, eventually pinpoint I got five subsystems that are going to be important to conscious experience, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, and I guess uh, well, yeah, one other thing I want to uh, we can make sense of this in terms of brain processing, um, but you can also think of modules in terms of like math. So uh, you can have you can define like you can define a function f of x uh, in terms of, uh, or you can think of like the function uh, f of x y. Uh, so it takes two inputs. And we can just define that function as, uh, uh, I don't know, g of x plus 4 times uh, h of y. Um, so we, we, we have this notion in math where you can basically uh, define high level functions in terms of like lower level functions. Uh, and you can kind of keep going down and down. You can define g of x in terms of two other functions or three functions. You can define h of x in terms of other functions. But the point being that. Uh, you know, this is supposed to be analogous to what's going on in the brain, where you have particular parts of the brain that are responsible for that they do particular kinds of things. Uh, you have subsystems of those systems. You have subsystems of those systems. Uh, but they're each going to be uh, attacking a particular kind of task. Um, cool. Uh, OK, unless there are any other questions about that, I'll move on to uh, dual process theory. So. Uh, so dual process theory posits that when an organism encounters a cognitive task, uh, it can deploy two kinds of systems uh, to perform that task. So uh, these two systems are supposed to be distinct. Uh, they're function functionally and evolutionarily. Um, so what has become, been called system one is fast, parallel, automatic, um, relatively rigid, and unconscious. Um, so system one processes uh, happen at a level prior to conscious reflection. Um, uh, system one processes can quickly analyze inputs based on pre-established computational architecture. So the end result of this processing um, can be posted to an individual's consciousness, but that individual has very limited or no access to the processes that generated the output. So you know, whenever, when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, looking at my water bottle and I see it as a water bottle, and I recognize it as a water bottle. Um, I didn't have to go through any sort of like complex process where I was like, well, the, it has straight edges and it's translucent and it looks like it's, it's cylindrical and I can see there's some clear liquid inside of it. Um, no, all this happened at a pre-conscious level. Um, something in my brain had to do the processing such that I can identify it as a water bottle. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we, we have in mind when we're talking about system one processes. Namely, it's these, module, it's these little modules that we're talking about when we talk of uh, system one processes. Um, so yeah, system one processes are supposed to be distributed throughout the brain. Um, system one, if we want to call it a single system, is composed of many small, largely autonomous local modules um, uh, that deal in domain-specific information handling. Um, so uh, you know, they cannot be quickly altered by verbal instruction, um, but they can and do change as a result of um, 
habituation, uh, just like uh, or training. So as you're growing up, you can learn to um, uh, train yourself to see things in particular ways. Um, uh, in addition to these functional features, System One is supposed to be evolutionarily older, so it represents the kind of intelligence that humans share with other animals. Um, the, and these modules that comprise System 1 are supposed to be relatively uh, rudimentary and developed to address very specific evolutionary needs. Um, so perceptual modules are, percep uh, are perhaps the best example of these, of these, spe specific, of these modules with specific uh, evolutionarily relevant tasks. So you know, take our ability to recognize faces. I think this is a, a, a good example of a pretty complex um, System 1 task. Um, so we, we have... Uh, we have a dedicated face recognition module in the Fusiform Gyrex, uh, which has the job of analyzing certain per configurations of shapes uh, and determining whether or not there's any uh, whether or not there's any th any faceness about these shapes. So when you see something like uh, when you see something like this, um, your Fusiform Gyrex apparently is, um, according to neuroscientists, is going to be taking in these shapes and saying, you know, whenever I see, uh, I guess, two roundish things with a pointy thing and a mouthy thing, uh, that gives you a face. Um, and this is a really, really hard uh, computational task. I mean, we have, uh, we have software engineers who have spent years of their life trying to figure out um, how to solve this, this task. And it's, uh, and, and it's gotten good-ish recently, but it's, the computers still aren't as good as we are. Um, at these kind of complex recognition tasks. Um, but there's a specific part of the brain that is, uh, that is responsible for this. Uh, and uh, moreover, you're not really in on that processing. I mean, this is the point I guess I was making before, but I'll make it again, that you know, when, uh, when you're examining this face and you see it as a face, you don't have to like, do a little math problem in your head to figure out that it's a face. It's something that just, just comes to you automatically. Um, it's a process that's running on its own, um, doesn't need your input. Um, so that's, that's system one processes. Uh, so system two uh, is supposed to be a slow, serial, uh, deliberate, uh, flexible, and conscious. Um, so I'll explain each of those terms in turn. But, so it's, it's slow and serial and deliberate since it involves conscious analysis by means of uh, abstract categories and concepts. Um, it's flexible in the sense that uh, any individual may develop their own strategies about how to go about addressing certain types of information. Um, so system two then admits of more individual differences. Uh, so when we're each solving kind of system two problems, we'll each go about that in different ways. Um, I think probably the best way to think of this is, you know, you can think of the problem, sol like this, uh, the problem of solving whether or not there's a face there is a problem that system one solves. Um, uh, a different kind of problem that System 2 solves is, uh, you can think of, I don't know, an addition problem. Uh, so when you're confronted with this, uh, you need to have a strategy that you come up with um, or that you've learned to figure out how to do this. Uh, and you apply it in a deliberate way. So you have to say, um, uh, so you have to, uh, I hope I get this right. Um, yeah, so you have to get the 2 to 7 gives you 9. Um, the one and four give you five, and then you just bring the one on down. Yeah. Um, so what I did right there was a particular process. Um, I, I followed certain rules that I'd learned. Um, I had those thoughts in a serial fashion. I first told myself I need to look at these two numbers. I then need to uh, use the rule of addition to get uh, number nine. If this was above 10, I would need to put the, um, I put the single digit here and carry over the one. Um, the, the point is, is that uh, this all has to happen in, like, a, in a very slow way where I follow one thought to the next. And this is something I have to learn. Um, so these are two different kinds of problems that we solve in two different kinds of ways. Um, so, um, right, okay. Uh, how much do I want to Well, I guess any general questions about system one and system two? Um, yeah. Right, OK. So flexible, you can think of, um, we, there are maybe, if we can come up with, if we have maybe a certain type of problem that um, fits in a general category, but is maybe new or novel, 
Um, when, we're, when we're engaging in slow, deliberative thought, we can come up with new solutions like on the fly. Um, so you can think of the, the point about flexibility as just being a point about being able to uh, solve novel problems. So when, um, uh, well, here's, here's an example of the inflexibility of system, system two, or system one. Uh, so this is a famous illusion uh, called the Mueller liar lines. Let me get this right. Um, so the, uh, if I drew it right, you should get this, you should basically see the, uh, the, the first figure, the figure on the top, as longer than the bottom figure. Is that, is that, that's right, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so this is basically a, a, a very basic feature of your visual system that you're going to see uh, shapes like this. Uh, the top one is longer than the bottom one, but in fact, they're the same size. Um, that if you go and take a measuring stick, you'll notice that they're both the same, same length. Uh, but even though, like, whenever, so whenever I look at this and I, and I tell my visual system, oh, you stupid visual system, see this the right way. They're not, there are equal lines. They're not, the, the top one's not longer than the, the bottom one. Even though I tell my visual system that, my visual system doesn't care. Uh, it just is going to churn out the same output every time. Uh, it doesn't, I can't, uh, uh, you know, I can't just basically tell my system one processes to, to, to perform in a different way. They're just going to go on doing what they, what they do. Uh, and that's, that's, I guess, the flexibility of distinction. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, one, that reminds me, I do want to say one thing about, uh, one thing I mentioned was system one processes are domain specific, and system two processes are domain general. The point here is just that, um, you know, if I, if, I give, uh, if I give the math problem to my visual system, uh, it can't solve that. That's not a problem that it solves. It solves very particular kinds of problems. It solves visual problems. Um, it solves problems that arise in me trying to extract information from, my, uh, from the light hitting my, my retina. Um, but uh, my domain general processing machine, um, I can use that to really solve any problem you give me. Um, you know, give me any kind of novel problem. Uh, you can ask me to come up with uh, proofs that that, uh, that prove mathematical theorems. You can ask me to uh, write a play. You can ask me to uh, decide whether or not I should invest $10,000 in a fund. Like, you can give me any problem at all, and I can solve that using uh, system two processing. But the, the trade off, though, is that system two processing is a lot slower, it's a lot less efficient. Um, so if I have a system one module that can solve this problem quickly and efficiently, I'll, I'd rather just let that thing do it. Um, and that's the difference between. Uh, I guess system one and uh, system two. So um, the, I guess Dehan and Kosh, uh say that, they capture this when they say that controlled processing requires a distinct functional architecture which goes beyond modularity and can establish flexible links amongst uh, existing processors. So you know, we, we talked before about the modular mind. You can think of the, the modules are all instantiating system one processes. But the, the real question is, is that, we, we, do some, we know that we do something else with our, with, with our brain. Uh, we know that we can solve these general problems that are not confined to um, particular, uh, particular kinds of problem solving that are rigid and inflexible. Uh, what we want, we want some description of a system that, that solves general problems in a flexible way, uh, but maybe does it more slowly um, than other systems. So um, the answer to this question um, is supposed to be the global workspace. So uh, I guess I'll quickly kind of run through some of the features of the global workspace, and we'll uh, kind of test it out as a hypothesis. So um, feature one of the global workspace, uh, besides specialized processors, so I'm just, these are just coming straight from the paper. Uh, besides specialized processes, the architecture of the human brain also comprises a distributed neural s system or workspace with long distance connectivity that can potentially interconnect multiple specialized brain areas in a coordinated, um, uh, though variable, manner. So through the workspace, modular systems uh, that do not directly exchange information in an automatic mode can nevertheless gain access to each other's content. So if we want to amend this, this drawing, you have, you have all these subsystems going about solving your problems. Um, but when I need to solve a problem like, uh, 
you know, am I, uh, am I going to go out to eat or am I going to make dinner myself? Um, uh, what I get is I get a lot of subsystems uh, giving me information across different modalities and, and sharing that with, 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 with each other. So I need to know, um, to make that decision, I say, hmm, like, well, what am I hungry for? Am I hungry for uh, the pasta I have, or, or do I really want that Big Mac? Uh, do I, uh, you, you have to ask yourself, well, um, I would go out and drive to McDonald's, but my, my car doesn't have enough gas. I remember that from yesterday. Um, so I, in fact, I actually should stay inside. Um, these, are these are calling up all sorts of different kinds of information that are relevant to a particular um, decision that you have to make. And you wouldn't be able to do that if, if all these pieces of information were locked away in their individual modules. You need this global workspace that connects these different systems, um, that allows them to share information amongst one another uh, in a coordinated manner. Um, and this is supposed to be uh, supposed to be established via, uh, I guess, uh, what they call long distance uh, long distance connecti connectivity neurons. Um, these are basically uh, these are working memory neurons that are uh, localized to different modules. But uh, when you put them all together, they form a uh, a system in which which these modules can can talk to one another effectively. Um, but you know there there are certain limitations about what can what can what kind of information these long connectivity neurons can uh, can uh, uh, I guess can broadcast. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, all right, so that's the basic picture. Uh, another key component for Dehane and Akash is that uh, top-down attentional amplification is the mechanism by which modular processes can be temporarily mobilized and made available to the global workspace, and therefore to consciousness. So you can think of, if we have this central global workspace, you can think of, uh, for various reasons, this is a bad analogy, but I'll make it anyway, uh, that you can think of there's a, a, uh, like a spotlight of consciousness that's able to zoom in on particular information in the global workspace. Uh, it can also uh, call forth information from particular modules. You can say, you can, attention can, uh, you can use your, t your powers of attention to, to tell the visual system, hey, give me the red stuff in the scene. Um, this is a real problem that I guess has been well studied. Uh, but you can basically, uh, through attention, you can say, uh, visual system, give me, uh, give me all the round things that are, that are in front of me. And the visual system can go away and basically re send back to the global workspace uh, all the round things that are in the scene. Um, and uh, the, so attention plays a really, really crucial role uh, in this theory uh, and a crucial role in, uh, in establishing what is and what is not conscious. So um, uh, I guess moving on. So the, uh, the, the third feature that Dehane and Hakash uh, pinpoint is that you know, according to the workspace theory, uh, conscious access requires temporary, a dynamic, dynamical mobilization of an active processor um, into a self-sustained loop of activation. Uh, so active workspace neurons send top-down amplification signals that boost the currently active processor neurons, uh, whose bottom-up signals in turn help maintain workspace activity. So uh, the establishment of this closed loop requires minimal duration. Uh, that thus imposing a temporal granularity to the successive neural states that form the stream of consciousness. Um, uh, this is basically just making the point I was, I was making before that uh, you need to have information sustained in, in this global workspace. You need the power of attention to uh, provide top-down amplification of signals. Um, attention plays a very crucial role here. Um, so an, an interesting, uh, uh, I guess, posit that Dehane and Akash make is that there are really five main categories of subsystems that, that uh, plug into uh, this global workspace. So things that don't make it in, things like my blood pressure, um, or regulating my blood pressure. There's a part of my brain that, uh, that, uh, whose job it is to regulate my blood pressure. And it does that uh, without me ever really knowing it does that. Um, I don't ever, uh, unlike my breathing, I can take control of my breathing. I can. Uh, tell myself to breathe slowly or fast. Uh, I can never take, take control over uh, my, my blood pressure regulation uh, mechanisms. Uh, so you know, there are only some parts of the brain end up reporting to this global workspace. So the five areas that Dehane and Akash pinpoint are uh, perceptual circuits that inform about the state of the environment, 
motor circuits that allow for preparation uh, and of controlled execution of actions, uh, long-term memory systems that reinstate past workspace uh, states, evaluation circuits that attribute valence in relation to previous experience, uh, and lastly, uh, attentional or top-down circuits that selectively gate the focus uh, of interest. Um, and they think that this, that these five things, so perception, motor control, long-term memory, evaluation, and attention, these things explain uh, what it's the subjective unitary nature of consciousness. So when we think about what kinds of things we can be conscious of, we think about memories, we think about uh, controlling our actions, we think about um, uh, you know the perceptual inputs we're getting. Um, we think about and we think about being able to control our attention within. Uh, what's kind of being displayed in consciousness. Um, so re they really think that this is going to be answering some deep questions about uh, what is possible for us to be conscious of, what, the, uh, what kinds of things we can be conscious of. Um, so I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to do a lot with this. Um, and I mean, so, I mean they, they say that you know, we believe that many of these so-called hard problems will be found to dissolve uh, once a satisfactory framework for consciousness is achieved. Um, so now we can, we can really ask the question we've been meaning to ask the whole time. You know, so there's a philosophical question here. The paper, uh, I should note, you know, it's not making, uh, it's merely just assertions of fact. Um, this is a paper that, uh, you know, we don't want you to write this kind of paper when you write papers for us. Um, it's just saying, uh, there are a couple places where it says, well, clearly certain philosophers are wrong for, because they're clearly wrong. Um, that's not an argument. But we can ask, basically, whether or not uh, there are reasons to support this theory. So the, the question we have in mind is, what is the nature of consciousness? Uh, the answer is going to be that consciousness is constituted by uh, the broadcasting of information in a global workspace in a sufficiently configured system. Um, so this is a this is gonna this is gonna give us like real results. Um, we can ask uh, of the blind sight patients. We can ask, well, look, is the is information about what is in their, uh, their blind spot. Is that available to the global workspace? If it's not, uh, then it can't be conscious. Um, if, it, if it is available to it and it is called forth and is act actively in the global workspace, then it is conscious. Um, this is a pretty clear criterion to say, uh, in actual cases, uh, it, it can get us results. It can tell us what, what is in the mind and what is not in the mind. And you can do that by, uh, well, uh, the, the techniques aren't, uh, aren't totally there yet, but you can do part of it by fMRI imaging uh, and the like. And, uh, uh, I guess you might be able to do it uh, using other techniques, but that's probably the most popular these days. Um, and I think the, the theory is supposed to be something like, uh, you know, we've been looking at uh, different attempts to say that you know, the mind or consciousness, is, we can think of it in terms of the kinds of reductions we do in other, in other kinds of science. So we can say that, um, we can say that temperature, just is um, mean kinetic energy, or mean kinetic velocity. That, that's the, I should know my science better. Uh, we can just say that uh, lightning just is electrical discharge. And consciousness, is, uh, on this theory, uh, we're making a similar kind of identity claim. Consciousness just is uh, uh, consciousness just is the activity that goes on in global workspace, and the global workspace can be uh, can be instantiated by a brain, it can be instantiated by a computer, it can be instantiated by any system that has this kind of functional structure. Um, and uh, so there's going to be some kind of just brute physical law about um, you know when I have consciousness of something red. Uh, you might think that, you know, we've been talking about inverted spectrum cases. Uh, there might just be, on this theory, there might just be some kind of brute law about uh, when a certain type of information is put to a certain type of use in a global workspace, it's going to produce the red sensation. Um, and I mean, that's at least the answer that it's trying to provide. Now, there, there are, I guess, problems with this. And that's really, I guess, what I want to uh, address in the next section. But before I get there, does, do people, I guess, do we know what is being claimed? Uh, are there any, I guess, questions about how the theory is supposed to work? Uh, I mean, I've been using a lot of like new terms. So 
Tell me what doesn't make sense. I'm sure, I'm sure there's something about this that doesn't make sense to someone. Yeah? You keep saying that there's a special area in our mm -hmm. brain uh, that is an active part for this local mm -hmm. or space. Yeah. Uh, which is responsible for all the communication stuff. Yeah, I, so they, they actually address this, at, I think, the, towards the end of the paper. But the, they, they don't want to say that there's one localized spot. Um, I think basically, I think there, if I understand them correctly, there are going to be these um, working memory areas associated with every one of these, these modules. Uh, and uh, at least the modules that, that uh, uh, work together in this global workspace, uh, they're not, there's not going to be some kind of central system that, uh, that is always there when they're communicating. But this, you can think of, it, it's maybe like an analogy. You can think of the fact that all these, works, uh, that all these different modules are talking to one another through these long distance neurons. Um, it uh, basically creates uh, some kind of workspace in which they all share information. Um, although they do actually, I mean, maybe I'm making the case, uh, maybe I'm making too negative a case. They do uh, pinpoint the, uh, the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate as uh, the places where these long distance um, global workspace neurons uh, have a lot of connections. So um, one, I guess one popular hypothesis is that uh, executive control is a function of the prefrontal cortex uh, and that without the prefrontal cortex, if you lop off the prefrontal cortex, um, or, or if you have a lesion in the prefrontal cortex, you no longer have the ability to, uh, to engage in the kind of serial, uh, serial decision-making processes that are uh, indicative of system two processes. Um, so basically, the, my answer to the question is that this is very debated. <laughs> um, uh, but I think Dehane and Akash are going to be are going to think that they don't need to answer the question. Any other questions? Yeah. So is consciousness based on the coinage in this global workspace? And the coinage in the global workspace is the conscious stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is going to be, you can think of the, uh, I guess one, actually one person who, the person who came up with the global workspace theory originally called it the, um, I think I actually called it the blackboard theory of consciousness. And the idea is that you have, uh, you can basically post different pieces of information to a blackboard. So you, you write on it. Uh, and then you erase one bit, and then you write on a new bit. Um, and the, the idea is that there's going to be basically uh, a, a, a system which uh, all the content of consciousness is going to be contained in that system. Um, so uh, insofar as you're conscious of something, it has to be active in the global workspace. Um, so when you're, so you can ask, like, uh, when I'm listening to a song, uh, the like the feeling that the song produces in me, the the beat that I hear, um, the I recognize the person's voice as Paul McCartney's. Uh, all these all these things that I'm conscious of, they're all a part of the global workspace, and you can think of those as kind of different pieces of information that are on the blackboard. Um, but was that the kind of question you were asking? Uh, okay, yeah. So the I mean the basic the kind of problem we're trying to solve with this is. Um, they want to give a theory about like what is it that makes information in the brain conscious? Because um, there's information all throughout the brain doing like you know I, there's information processing of how to regulate my blood pressure, but I'm not conscious of that. Um, I'm also not conscious of uh, you know the very com complex, sophisticated computational processes that that underlie edge detection and shape recognition. Um, these are these are things that I'm not uh, that are not consciously available to me. But the things that are consciously available to me are the stuff that gets posted to the global workspace. Uh, and uh, that's supposed to be, well, yeah, that's a theory. Yeah, Kira? So there's no place that is the global workspace? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's maybe similar to the question uh, before. But uh, I think, I think Tehan and Akash kind of wiggle on this. They, they say that the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate are the important places. Uh, but they also say that you can maybe have Two systems. So you maybe have like two systems that communicate with one another, uh, and this will create like a mini workspace. Um, it's actually unclear. I think this is basically an area of where they say that they need to do more work. Um, but uh, I, I believe the stock answer is that the what they're picking out are working memory centers in each of these uh, these modules, and when those working memory centers work together, they create like a, a virtual workspace. So there's not there need not be. Uh, a particular part of the brain that 
is receiving all these signals, um, it can just be instantiated by all these things being connected to one another. Yeah, David. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that is the the that definitely seems to be the direction that Dehan Nakash seemed to go in. Uh, that's not helpful. Yeah, you can think of it as as not located in a specific area, but something that when all the pieces are working together, they uh, it's they create it together. Um, yeah. So if conscious things exist in the workspace, where do unconscious things exist? Right. Uh, so I think they're. I mean. Uh, like blood you can, pressure, like where would, right. So you can think of blood pressure as there's this little module over here that's working away. It doesn't broadcast that knowledge to the global workspace. It gets inputs from I don't know your blood, I don't, um, <laughs> and its outputs and its outputs go to control the blood. I don't know <laughs> enough about it, but um, sorry, let's say that again. Right, right. So it doesn't really need. Uh, uh, David doesn't have yeah, it. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think the 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 point that Dehan and Nakash would want to make though is that uh, you know I could have maybe this module over here has has ways of communicating to the blood pressure module, and I can uh, send an order from the global workspace to this module that then thereby cascades and has an effect on the so whenever I I don't know whenever I see a scary thing and that scary thing goes over to this uh, motor response uh, module the motor response module as part of um, uh, uh, initiating a, a response act, uh, activates higher blood pressure. Um, it can do that, uh, but I can't send a message to the 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 blood pressure module directly and say, uh, "Amp up the blood pressure." Yeah, um, you can send a message to the motor response system, and then maybe the motor response system, uh, independent of what you want, amps up the blood pressure. But uh, at least I think that's that's the the model that they have in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they're basically just they're just doing the science and trying to figure out what actually does report there. Um, but I think the so you can make two. There's two answers. Uh, well, one way of construing your question is something like, uh, you know, what uh, what differentiates between the things that I now have control over that I didn't have control over in the past. Or also, what kinds of things do I do? Humans have control over now that we didn't have control over in the past. And you can give both a developmental. You can you can give a evolutionary story about uh, how these systems came to be hooked up in the way they did, or the way they're now hooked up. Um, uh, you can also provide a learning story about how we learned. Uh, like so, for instance, whenever you learn how to play the piano, um, uh, when you learn how to play the piano, uh, this is when you're playing a song for memorization. This is going to be a system one task. This is going to be something that you basically programmed a system one module to do on its own. Uh, but you know, it took learning to do that. Um, and whenever, as you're playing the piano piece, you can decide whether or not you want to, I guess, take back control. You can say, actually, I'm going to uh, play this more lightly than I've been playing it, uh, or I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to actually switch this and play it an octave higher, or something. Um, you can make those decisions and kind of. Step in and take over the driver's seat where you didn't have it before. Uh, but this, but the story about about how the uh, uh, about what you're conscious of now, what you could be conscious of now, uh, and how that relates to the module that's really responsible for it is going to be a story that you have to tell by uh, how learning occurs in the brain, or 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 how how evolution hooked up the global workspace with the module. Yeah. Oh, you can control your emotions, and sometimes they say that you can't control your emotions. So, like, 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Where is that? Um, good. Well, uh, that is a very hard question. Uh, I actually wrote my undergrad thesis on that. So, um, but uh, it's uh, all I'll say is uh, uh, it's a very controversial question. <laughs> um, I think basically the the idea would be that you uh, you might be able to control your motions in the way that you control. Uh, your ability to play a, uh, a masterpiece concerto on the piano, uh, so you might not have uh, you might not have immediate control over your emotional responses. It might be something like uh, you know you you can train your dog so that whenever you snap, they jump up on their hind legs or something like that. But you can't just when, on the very first day you get your dog, if you snap your fingers and the the dog jumps up, um, that would be like a miracle. Um, you would you have to go through a training process to teach yourself how to um, respond, uh, how to have different kinds of um, uh, responses, and let me likewise for, um, for motions. I do think, though, I do think that uh, no matter what your theory is, they're going to disallow uh, what's called, I guess, synchronic control of emotional response. So uh, in, uh, as you're experiencing the emotion itself, you can't just tell yourself, uh, stop feeling this emotion. Uh, it needs to be a kind of a, a longer process of training. Um, David, do you have a Right. It's never that we it's never that we say we just tell them, okay, I'm feeling down now or I'm like it's okay if I'm getting puppy. But everything mm. everything's getting yeah. better or everyone's like I feel better. It's it's more it's more that we are indicating <coughs> that we call in it mm. to be alarmed to be sad or uh, accountable mm. for 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 doing it or for for doing it again. Yeah. yeah. Or or for uh, for I think it's a great way of putting it. We can distinguish between indirect and direct control. Uh, and I think the most people I think the standard the uh, picture is that you, you can't have direct control. You can have direct control over emotions. Um, so good. Uh, but we should probably move on because we don't have, let's see how much time. Uh, it, we, this ends at 3.30, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we should move on then. Uh, so, so I mean, the major, I guess the major problem with this theory is going to be, uh, I guess, what we looked at last time with Thomas Nagel. So um, um, I'll skip over. So uh, the first objection, uh, I won't go over now, but the the second objection is, you know, uh, uh, this is a this global workspace theory. It's a good answer, but just to a question we weren't asking. Um, you know, we this is this is a trivially true theory if we uh, if we say that if we construe the question of like what is consciousness narrowly, um, uh, we can if we say that basically you know what are the systems that underlie conscious experience, uh, we can answer that. I mean, the it, it seems just kind of maybe like a uh, question of neuroscience running its course. Um, uh, this is maybe, you know, you can think of this as a pretty hard problem, but in uh, philosophy, people tend to call this the easy problem. Um, it's easy to figure out how bits of information work in the brain. That's the easy part. The hard part is, um, you know, once we know all the things about that's going on in the, the bat's brain, uh, how can we use that to kind of give us an, any kind of information about the, what it's actually like to be the bat? And this is supposed to be the hard question. Um, so if we, construe, if we construe it kind of widely and we say, uh, you know, what is consciousness like, uh, including uh, having these, uh, what are, like, these experiences that these things produce, um, you know, this kind of third person objective account might just, just might not be the kind of thing that can take account, uh, account for that. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll make a reply on behalf of Dehane and Akash. Um, you might think that uh, you know there are, they might just be on board with what Nagel's saying and say that the only question we can answer is this uh, easy question. Um, and uh, it seems like we're making progress on this. You know, it's not like it's not trivial that we figured out that um, this is how information gets processed, um, and that if we you know if we made a computer that did all this. Uh, According to this theory, it would tell us uh, firmly. It would say that this thing has got to be conscious, um, and that's a that's an answer that we weren't able to to give before. Um, and so you're, you think of it as it's it's not just a an empty theory. Um, it's it's telling a, it's going to be giving answers to questions that we didn't that we weren't able to answer before. Um, but you you can also say that uh, you know there's there's more than one way of knowing. Um, 
the same the same thing. So uh, if I if there's a if there's a red tomato in front of me, I can look at the tomato. I can see that it's red. Uh, but if I'm colorblind, I can pull out my uh, spectrometer and do a light reading on the tomato, and I can find out that oh yeah, this tomato is red. Um, it's giving off the right wavelengths. Um, and you might think that I mean by uh, we, we, those two different methods are two ways of knowing the same fact about uh, the tomato. Um, you can, you can uh, discover that the tomato is red by using your eyes. You can discover the tomato is red by reading off a number on a spectrometer. Um, uh, the information is being uh, transmitted to you via two different systems. You're using your visual system to do the hard work in the first case. You're using a spectrometer to do the hard work in, this, uh, in the second case. Um, but you know, the basic fact the fact that the tomato is red is something you can kind of get in touch with via two channels. Uh, and similarly, I think maybe what Dehane and Akash would say is that, um, you know, I might not be able to know, uh, I might not be able to put myself in the shoes of the bat and say that uh, I'm conscious of uh, the echolocation and, it, and I can know that because it feels a certain way to me right now. But if we step outside the bat, we can say, look, the echolocation information is being projected in a particular way. They're able to do particular kinds of things in the brain, uh, and we can kind of uh, know a lot of the things that the bat knows, but via a different channel. Um, that's, I think, the best uh, response that De someone like Dehane Nakash could could give. Uh, I think there's still problems with that, uh, but I'm just making the case for them, and I'm curious to see what uh, hear what you guys think of it. But I guess we don't have that much time. I did want to briefly uh, kind of develop this point further. Um, so next class, we're actually going to look at someone uh, in a block who thinks that uh, there is a real question that still has to be answered after we give this kind of description of the, the functional architecture underlying consciousness. Um, and uh, we didn't read this paper, but in the Chalmers edition, uh, Chalmers volume you guys have, there's a paper uh, of blocks called uh, Concepts of Consciousness. And he talks about how. You know, we don't mean one thing when we talk about consciousness. Uh, he picks out two things, but um, you know, he starts off by saying that you know we often mean different things by the word consciousness. Um, we, uh, so he writes that the concept of consciousness is a hybrid, or better, a, a mongrel concept. Uh, the word consciousness connotes a number of different concepts and denotes a number of different uh, phenomena. So, you know, when you think of consciousness, you can think of uh, and we. We associate it with a, a, a number of different con concepts. We can say that consciousness is a matter of sentience. It's a matter of awareness. It's a matter of sensation. It's a matter of self-awareness. It's a matter of feeling, or it's a matter of intelligence. Um, all these things you might make a case for uh, you know, what we mean when we talk about consciousness. Um, Netblock uh, fixes on two, two kinds of concepts that we, could, uh, we normally have in mind when we talk about consciousness. So he talks about phenomenal consciousness, or P consciousness. He says, phenomenal consciousness is, an ex is experience. Um, what makes a state phenomenally conscious is that there is something it is like um, to be in that brain state. Here he's just basically pointing directly to what Nagel's saying. So Nagel points the what it is likeness of experience. Um, and uh, Bloch is calling that phenomenal consciousness. And uh, P consciousness properties include the experiential properties of sens sensations, um, feelings, and perceptions. But, uh, but Bloch also wants to include things like thoughts, wants, and emotions uh, as well, um, though perhaps they have a different sort of phenomenal consciousness. That's important. Um, he also talks about access consciousness, or A consciousness. And a representation is A conscious if it is broadcast for free use in reasoning for direct rational control or action, um, including reporting. So paradigmatically, uh, A consciousness is more thought-like, more cognitive, while P consciousness is more sensational or perceptual. Um, and I mean, there, you know, one kind of basic intuition that supports this is that you know, the conscious states associated with thought, rationality, these are like not the full-blooded consciousness states we have in mind when we, when we think about the kinds of things that are really puzzling. Um, we think that are really puzzling is like there's some kind of feeling going on that's associated with uh, the feeling of pain or some sensation that is associated with the sensation of redness. Uh, and that's kind of what's really puzzling about consciousness. Why would that even, why, why, what is that? Why is that there? Um, and uh, so I'll just, I'll just say right now, and maybe I, think, I, hope, I think Austin will be addressing this next time, but uh, Bloch thinks that these two things can become detached from one another. 
So you can have a state that is A conscious that's not P conscious. You can have a state that is P conscious but not A conscious. And if that's true, then this, this theory as a theory of consciousness does not work. Um, uh, you basically have, you would have states that uh, you, that are, there are like qualia associated with them, but they're not accessible in the workspace. Um, you would also have pieces of information that are in the workspace which have no uh, feeling associated with them at all. Um, and uh, if that's true, it would seem like this theory just isn't doing the kind of work we wanted to do. Um, and, but you know, so there's a real question here though. You know, can we separate the sort of uh, functional properties of consciousness from the phenomenal properties of consciousness? Uh, if you're going with the global workspace theory, you're going to say that you can't just because of some brute, uh, brute physical law. Uh, and next class, I think we're going to look at someone who says, no, these two things come apart, and we can talk meaningfully about this phenomenal consciousness stuff. Um, and I think uh, we have three minutes left. Uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll take questions for the, uh, or does anyone have questions about the nature of the problem, why this might be unsatisfactory, or want to make the case for it? All right, sounds like you guys want to head out a little early. So um, thank you for coming. Um, uh, oh, we'll see you Thursday.